The treatment landscape of neuroendocrine tumors, or NETS, has experienced exponential growth through the addition of several new agents after decades of limited therapeutic options. Now clinicians must focus on how to optimally sequence these therapies. In this OncLive peer exchange today, we will discuss the importance of multidisciplinary care for these patients, discuss available treatment options and emerging therapies. My name is Dr. Simran Singh. I'm a medical oncologist and co-lead of the Susan Leslie Clinic for Neuroendocrine Cancers at the Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Toronto, Ontario. I'm also an associate professor at the University of Toronto. Joining me today is Dr. Jonathan Strotsberg, head of the Neuroendocrine Division and chair of gastrointestinal department research at the Moffitt Cancer Center and associate professor of the University of South Florida College of Medicine. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so John, Maybe we'll start by talking about um, the biological mechanisms that drive neuroendocrine cancers. What do you think about that? Sure. So the underlying biology of NETS is relatively unique compared to most, uh, most cancers. Probably best characterized for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors where most of the genetic mutations uh, seem to involve chromatin remodeling. So things like MEN1, which is uh, present in 40% of uh, uh, pancreatic NETS as a somatic mutation. In addition, of course, to the MEN1 hereditary, which is probably about 1% to 2%. Uh, genes such as DAX and ATRAX also involved in chromatin remodeling. And then about 15% uh, involving the mTOR pathway. So PIK3CA, P10, things of that nature. Uh, overall, the mutational burden in well-differentiated nets tends to be quite low. Uh, as you know, in small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, we know much less about underlying genetic mutations. Uh, epigenetic changes seem to be uh, the driver of carcinogenesis, um, but there are very few targetable mutations, and generally we're talking about tumors with a very low mutational burden. Uh, of course, on the other end of the spectrum are poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas with mutations that are much more common, such as P53, RB, RAS, um, and um, uh, so, you know, it's a very heterogeneous uh, um, uh, type of cancers, a family of cancers, and, and each primary site and well versus poorly differentiated has its own unique biological mechanisms. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the incidence and prevalence of NETS that seems to be increasing quite a bit over the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. As you know, we've been seeing more and more cases of neuroendocrine cancers or NETS, and uh, we've been seeing that. Uh, there's, of course, uh, Dr. Yao's paper from 2008 published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, which first uh, described this phenomenon. Uh, Arvind Desai, after that, did an update as well, uh, which showed that the rate continued to rise. In, in Canada, we also did a very similar study where we found basically the similar results, increasing incidence of NETS. And when you look around the world, a lot of registries were seeing uh, the same phenomena of uh, more and more neuroendocrine cancers. I don't know what the real cause of that is. I speculate it's probably just due to better classification, better understanding of the disease. Although it's interesting, even the Nordic uh, registries are showing an increase. In, and as you know, in the Nordic areas, they were quite advanced in uh, classifying these tumors quite early on. Right. And so there may be something in there as well about an increase. So you uh, think there might incidence. be a real increase in disease? There might be. I might be, you know, both. But I, I clearly think better understanding classification has just right. helped us understand that there's more of these tumors out there than we ever thought, probably. Right. And we're, uh, we're obviously picking up a lot of small incidental tumors as Absolutely. patients undergo right. routine scans. Uh, and routine endoscopies, and sometimes it's a little bit of a conundrum uh, how to deal with uh, really small, low-grade, potentially not clinically significant tumors, but yet tumors that cause a lot of uh, anxiety among patients. We know from autopsy series that the actual incidence of neuroendocrine neoplasms, if you look carefully enough, is, is well in excess of 1%. So there's a lot of really small, clinically insignificant neuroendocrine tumors out there and we're definitely picking, a lot, picking up a lot more of those. And I think that's going to be a big area for us in the future is to try to understand, as you alluded to, what do we do with these uh, small uh, lesions? Uh, would, people have, would it affect people's life? Do we need to treat them? If so, how? And what is the most patient-centered, uh, least invasive way that we deal with these lesions if we need to? Exactly. And, you know, when it comes to prevalence, because even patients with metastatic disease can live for many years, I think... Uh, it's been shown that the prevalence of NETS is, is well over 100,000 in the United States, making it actually the second most prevalent GI cancer after colorectal cancer. So, you know, NETS are often thought of as, as very rare, but at least uh, uh, 
uh, when you think of prevalence, they're, they're quite common. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. I think uh, we need to realize that there's many patients living with neuroendocrine cancer, much like a chronic cancer, and uh, we need to uh, meet their needs when we're talking about what kind of treatments we want to develop. And I think it's also important for uh, our colleagues to understand uh, that there are a lot of patients living with neuroendocrine cancer and, and maintaining their daily lives.